This is a podcast about one woman's mission to help entrepreneurs and business owners write better business books. Each week, we tackle your writing excuses, because there are excuses too, and help you beat the blank page of doom so that you can write the book that will grow your life and your business. Now, here's your host, Vicky Fraser. Hello, and good morning, and welcome to the 1000 Author Show. I am Vicky Quinn Fraser, and this is Joe Fraser. Oh my god, I can't cope if I, I can't cope if you're gonna go around changing the words. I don't know what the words were. That anyway. was weird. Good Hello. morning. We have a giant cup of tea each, which is brilliant. Um the sun is shining. It's Easter Monday. We should have already recorded this by now. Sorry, Podfly. Um <laughs> uh, but here we are. Yes. Better late than never. It's been a really lovely long weekend. Well, it's not over yet. Mm. Got a whole other day yet. I know, right? What are we going to do with it? We are going to maybe build, build most, a wall. Build a wall, mow some lawn, um, build a niche. Yeah. And I've planted a bunch of seeds yesterday. I might plant a few more today. Nice. I know. That's very good. I'm going to do some reading. Maybe mow some lawn. Maybe mow some lawn. Yeah, we should mow the lawn. It's getting a bit. The thing is, though, it's there's a bit shaggy out there. forget me nots all over the. No, we could mow this lawn down here, though, couldn't we? Because mm. it's very long, and I think it's just going to. Make the lawnmower get stuck. It might be more like a strim than a mow. Yeah. Yes. So, um, yes. Joe, what have you been reading? Um, I have just finished reading uh, Child of Boyhood, Youth by Leo Tolstoy. Oh, have you finished it? Yes. Oh, did you enjoy it? Um, yes. Kind of. You give me a different answer every time I ask you that. It's all right. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rush to read it again. Um, slightly annoyingly, it finishes by saying, and I'm paraphrasing here, something along the lines of um so anyway this ends this chapter of my life and the next chapter is going to be brilliant um i'll write that next <laughs> so you, you you need to find the next one now he didn't write it did he not no were you looking he hasn't written it oh well it's a bit late now he's dead isn't he i, I would expect so yes yeah um okay so that's dull oh sad times okay well good um it's always good to leave people wanting more. It's nice to give them more. <laughs> but um, um, I am reading, my fiction is Murder on the Orient Express. I just started it last night by okay. Agatha Christie. I have never read any Agatha Christie. Right. So I thought, and then I, I was listening to the Slightly Fox podcast the other day and they were talking about detective stories mm -hmm. and like cosy mysteries. And obviously Agatha Christie came up quite a lot, um, as well as Dorothy L. Sayers and um, a writer called... E D R some letters Lorac, um, and it was a woman called Carol somebody. Um, and anyway, she got her pen name from spelling Carol backwards. I'd never heard of her before. Walked into our local bookshop to pick up a book that I'd ordered the other day, and there she was on the shelf. So you like, bought it? No, I didn't. What? I bought three different books instead. <laughs> Um, so yes, I am reading Murder on the Orient Express. Um, I'm literally like 15 pages into it, so I don't really have much of an opinion on it yet, but I like her writing style. Is is there a sequence in which you're supposed to... I mean, it, which Agatha Christie is this? Is this Poirot or is this... This is Poirot. This is Poirot. Is there, is there a sequence you're supposed to read them in? Possibly, but I thought I would start with her most popular because, you know, if that's the one that everybody likes, then it's probably a good one for me to start with. Okay. But I'm, I am going to then read them all in order because... I mean, you do have a history of not following through when you start a sequence of books. No, that's just with the Wheel of Time. Oh, yeah, so I abandoned it. Okay, right. So last time we talked, I was reading the Wheel of Time book two. I got 56% of the way through it and was like, this is bullshit, I'm done. And the reason, the reason that I got so cross with it is because, A, because I hate all of the characters in it. Um, they all irritate me, like, all of them. So the first book in The Wheel of Time I thought was pretty good. It was a good story. I didn't like the characters as much as I liked the TV series version of the characters. Um, Rand is exceptionally annoying. Um, Matt, honestly, I think they should just drop him in a hole. Um, Perrin is nice. Eggwine is a bit wet compared to the character that she was portrayed as in the TV series. Nynaeve is okay. Moraine and Lana cool, but they weren't in it so much. But yeah, the main character, Rand, just... He was just annoying. Anyway, but I was like, okay, well, that, that story was okay, so I'll read book two. Um, and I was really persevering with book two. And at the point where they entered an alternative dimension um, and faffed around and met another really annoying character, um, and then we're just like, oh, we're just going to pop back out of that alternative dimension again. And it's like, what is happening? And then they ended up in this city just 
behaving like idiots. And then one of the characters kept trying to tell Rand something and was like, Rand, I need to... And Rand would go, nope, no time for that. And that happened like four times. And I was like, that is the most annoying, lazy bastard writer trope ever. It's just so irritating. <laughs> and so at that point, when this had happened again, I was like... It's just threw the book at the wall I and that am, was that. Yeah, I was like, I am done with this. I flipped the table <laughs> and was just like, nope. <laughs> nope's my way out of that. So yeah, the combination of really irritating characters, iffy writing, and just that trope. Oh, yes. Okay. And I was like, not, and time was, I would have persevered because I finished all of the books that I read. And I was like, how many books have... How many books are in the world, amazing books, that I'm never going to be able to read because there's so many of them? And then a microcosm of that, how many books are in my house that I haven't read yet? No, I'm done with this. I mean, to be fair, it's it's probably, it's reasonable that you ditched it now rather, like, because there's a real slump at, like, books five, six, and seven. <laughs> I can't believe you got past book two. Like, I can't <laughs> believe it. There's so much amazing fantasy out there and I having read and I'm aware that I've only read one and a half books, but it's gotta Oh come on, it's gotta do better than that. <laughs> epic fantasy has got to do better than that when there's so much good epic fantasy out there. Oh <sighs> fine. So by the way, if anyone's like, oh well what epic fantasy should I read then? David Eddings is great. Um NK Jemison is great. Um Octavia Butler is great. Um Robin Hobb. Brilliant. Love the Assassin's Apprentice series. That was cracking. Um, yeah, there's so much good stuff out there. So much good stuff. And of course, you know, the Lord of the Rings and all the rest of it. So anyway. So yeah, Murder on the Orient Express it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> and my non-fiction is How to Live a Life of Montaigne in tw- One Question and 20 Attempts at Answer by Sarah Bakewell. Uh, you're getting through that. You've said yeah. that a few weeks in a row now. Well, yes, I'm reading, I'm making notes in the margin quite a lot. So, um, but yeah, I'm really loving it. It's really good. And I've just ordered Montaigne's essays as well, which is a massive doorstop of a book. Um, and it's not the kind of thing you read from start to finish. You kind of dip you in and out of it. Pick an essay or two and read them. Yeah. So, um, so I'm really enjoying that. Um, but I've got my next books all lined up, ready to read. I'm just like, I want to read them all at once. Um, but then it takes me ages to read anything because I'm reading five books at once. Mm. <laughs> so I'm trying to read. Like, Agatha Christie is my, I'm going to bed. I'm in bed, yeah. I'm tired, and I'm just kind just of... Just going to enjoy reading a chapter yeah. of this and then fall asleep. Yeah. Um, uh, Sarah Bakewell is, that's the book that I read when I'm awake and I want to read something. Right. So, um, so yes, this week at Casa Dingle, we've been through that a little bit. We've done some gardening. Um, I weeded my raised bed. I planted lettuces, We moved, the, we moved the sheep down to the garden. Oh, we brought the sheep home, yeah. Silly sheep. They're nice. Um, and planted tomatoes, cucumbers, courgettes, peppers cauliflower what else did I plant beans french beans and marigolds cool yeah cool, cool. um and joe had a big bonfire last night with a couple of his buddies mm-hmm. that was nice he didn't burn all of the scrappy wood from the courtyard no, I, was, I came out this morning i was like huh. why is this still here yes <laughs> well that's because it needed moving <laughs> right okay <laughs> we got rid of a lot of stuff up the dingle though mm. you know all that we, we've got a we've got a lovely neighbor barbara who um kind of Hi, Barbara. Prunes trees <laughs> in her garden and then throws the timber over into our garden because we have a, the opportunity for a bonfire and she doesn't. Yeah, which is, which is nice. kind, of, kind of cheeky, but, you know, that's fine because she's Barbara and we love her. Yeah. <laughs> um, and on Saturday, we had a bunch of people around for Dungeons and Dragons of food and we all sat around our lovely table in the courtyard and ate loads of food and had chats and it was so lovely. It was nice to be outside with people again. <sighs> and Beth brought... Baby Dylan. Hi, Beth. Hi, Dylan. Hi, Dylan. And he was adorable. And uh, we've built some stud walls. It's all good. But that's not what we're talking about. Well, yeah. People aren't here for this. Well, I mean, some people are, I yeah. guess. But I've just been pressing escape. Phew. It's still recording. Yeah. You're all right. <laughs> um, so we're talking this week a little bit about the new vanity publishing. And I wrote an, oh, the new vanity publishing question mark is how I should have said that. Because, mm. you know, like... Vanity publishing is when you pay lots of money to have like three copies of your book printed and then you put it on your shelf and you give it to people who will never read it. Right. Yeah. Um, and then in the self-publishing came along and people were like, oh, it's just vanity publishing. And those people can fuck off, frankly. Um, but it, it does still, like self-publishing still in some circles has this kind of air of, you know, it's, it's vanity publishing. It's like, oh, 
you couldn't get published, therefore you're publishing it yourself. And in this episode, we're going to explain why that is absolute elitist bullshit. Um, And we're going to talk a little bit about um, self-publishing, indie publishing and traditional publishing and what's going on there. Cool. And it was inspired, this whole thing was inspired by an email that I was, I'm on somebody's email list and I like her very much. She's an amazing writer. She's she's a really good marketer. Um, You know, she's just a really great human. And I'm on her email list. Who is this person? I'm not going to name her. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Because I think that's a bit rude. Oh, it depends what she said. Well, I'm, it's, and it's not that she said, like, I'm not, it's, so what she said triggered me. Like, it jolted me and I was like, huh. And that, but that's what inspired this whole thing. And the reason, like, I'm not mad at her. I just, it made me feel a bit sad for her actually, because. um, What did she say? So she's written a book, which is great. I've got it. I've, I've read bits and pieces of it it's really good it's, it's kind of a book of essays as well um and she she was telling a story about how a stranger that she met at a marketing conference got excited about the fact that she'd written a book and they were like oh my god you've written a book which is a a, yep. a response that you get Legit. quite often when you've written a book and she was like oh no no I, i've published it myself don't get too excited right it didn't i didn't have a book deal or anything like that oh, that's and like popping your own balloon isn't it it is and yeah and her point was you know it's no big deal and it's like I was like, wait, 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 wait. First of all, it is a big deal because 99.9% of people never write a book and get it out there. They just don't. They talk about it. Lots of people talk about it. But even the act of writing a book is worthy of celebration. <laughs> even if the book is rubbish, it's like, you know, it's... it's... <laughs> you've, you've picked a thing to do and you've damn well gone and done it. Yeah. And it's like, I would rather rubbish books weren't being, you know, made into printed books because trees, blah, blah, blah. But that she hasn't written a rubbish book. She's written a really great book. Um, and her point was that she didn't want to, I'm going to do air quotes here, mislead anyone with her book because it didn't have a book deal attached to it. Right. And that was the thing that just, that was the thing that made me realise that A, she, she actually, you know, she doesn't live in the world of publish, book publishing and book writing in the way that I do. Uh, she doesn't know that much about it. Um but also that she's, you know, like like me, she's been in the online marketing world for a long time and she knows how slimy it can be and she knows how manipulative it can be and, you know, there's loads of sleazy tricks and all, all the rest of it. So I get that because one of those sleazy tricks is to kind of crown yourself an expert on something and then publish a book to prove it, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, whether or not whether or not you are actually a legit expert on that thing, it's like there's this idea that... Um, you're kind of lending an air, the book lends an air of authority. And that very phrase, lending an air of authority, it's like, well, are you an authority or are you not an authority? Because if you're not an authority, you've got no business claiming Mm -hmm. it. And also that's like, that's one of those things that, you know, like, like leader, like ally, you don't get to call yourself that. It's like other people decide whether you are, um, you know, anyway. So, so yes, um, you can use a book to make yourself out to be a bigger deal than you actually are, basically. And there are books out there that do that. I've read some absolutely shocking business books that mm-hmm. have clearly just been produced to lend an air of authority. And those people, and I, you know, I know enough about those the people who wrote them as well to know that they're asshats and they have <laughs> no business charging money for what they do. So, um, so yes, but that whole thing was like I, I kind of get where she was coming from, and you know, she doesn't want to mislead anyone, but she's not misleading anyone. She's like, written a book. She's written a book. And it was a very personal book as well. It was personal essays and it wasn't a how-to book. It wasn't It wasn't any of those things. So, yeah, so I kind of get where she was coming from. But also, I self-published all of my books except for my audio book, which, which Audible commissioned from me. So that kind of poked me in the feelings a little bit because I was... Because just for a second, it was like, huh, well, I'm not a proper author either then. And, you know, five... 10 years ago it would have been like that would have that would have had me in tears because I would have just been questioning everything I do but this I had sat and thought about it a bit it's like no this is actually this is actually really important um and I then was like no I'm going to start talking about independently publishing rather than self-publishing and that's quite an important distinction I think because it self-publishing can sound like vanity whereas independent publishing sounds like empowerment Mm -hmm. which is what it is so um so yeah so I kind of get where You know, I understand why she wrote what she did, but also why she said what she did to the person who she said it to. But it also made me feel a little bit sad. Yeah. Because it's not true. (laughs) Basically, it's it's not true. It's based on it's based it's based on nonsense. And um, so yeah, shall we explain why? Go on. Yeah. So because 
There's the air of authority books, but we earn our books. The people that I work with earn our books. It's like, I'm yeah. not going to, I wouldn't sit down and write a book about gardening, how to be a gardener. Because, because you know nothing about that. Because I know nothing about it. I might write about my hilarious adventures in trying to be a gardener, which is perfectly legitimate because it's I can write about like making my raised beds and planting my, you know, all mm-hmm. of the rest of it. But I'm not going to be like presenting myself as an equivalent to Monty Don or whatever <laughs> and being like, here is the expert book on gardening. Because it's just, I would very quickly be found out as a yeah, fraud. It's just not true. Yeah. Um, so we we write the books that we have earned, right? And it's, it's like, if you've been doing whatever it is that you do for, you know, three, four, five years or whatever, write your book because you're probably an expert on what, whatever you do. And if you're not an expert on whatever you do, then you should probably rethink, you know, what you're doing and how you're doing it. And everyone's got to start somewhere, but that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that we start right at the top pretending to be the big I am. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And so then... It, you think about the reason for creating the book and that's what really makes the difference. And if the reason that you're creating the book is to help people in some way, whether that's like entertaining them or solving a problem or helping them feel seen and heard, that's, that's awesome. And that is a legitimate reason to write a book. If it's solely to boost your business or your ego, I think you've got a problem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know, I'm not saying don't write your book, do whatever the hell you want. But if you, if you, if I guess if you just want a vehicle to say, I've written the book, it exists then do one of those write your book in 30-day book deals things. Yeah. <laughs> just smash it out. Yeah, just smash it out. You smash can... it out, stick a picture on the front and off you go. You can do that. I know people who've written books in a weekend. They're not good. <laughs> um, but their diehard fans love them. And you know what? It's like, if that's if that's your jam, go for it. I'm, you know, whatever. But if you've... I don't know. I'm just like, if you... That's, that's the kind of thing that I think makes people look a little bit askance at self-publishing. Because, you know, self-publishing is awesome. It has democratised publishing, but also it means that anyone can publish any old dross. And yeah. they do. Um, and so let's let's not do that. But also, you know, don't believe... Don't believe that the only way that a book can be worthy of pride is if it comes with a book deal. Somebody else has decided to buy it. Yeah, because that's just simply not true. You know, a book deal can be awesome. And if Penguin came knocking on my door, I would bite their flippers off, absolutely. But that is not what makes your book worthy. It's not what makes my book worthy. Um, What makes your book worthy is your message, your story, your intent, and how your book is received by the people who read it. And maybe that's only like 50 people. But if those 50 people have their lives changed by your book, how awesome is that? Hmm. Maybe you get a book deal and it doesn't change anybody's life, you know? What's what's the worthier book? I don't know. So... um, so yeah, I can tell you right now though that what makes your book worthy is not like a dusty old dude in an ivory tower making arbitrary decisions about which mainstream voice he's going to put out next because it fits his idea of what is worth publishing. Um, because that is, I mean, traditional publishing is changing, it is getting better, but also it gets it wrong all the time. Like it publishes trash. <laughs> Piers Morgan, exhibit A, Piers Morgan has had his book published. It's absolute trash like poisonous trash as well yeah um, but they know it's going to sell but they know it's going to sell so they put it out there and that's the thing it's like that is they are businesses and they have a duty to make money and so they are going to publish what they think is going to make the most money Piers Morgan is going to make a shit ton of money for them wrongly I think but you know whatever um and they miss out on incredible books from independent authors all of the time for a range of reasons some of the because of the reasons that I've just said and some because Certain voices just don't get heard. They don't get the same opportunities to be published as the rest of us, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I, in my MA, we had um, somebody, um, an expert, because they, they get guest experts in every now and then to do Q&A sessions. And um, this guy who worked in the publishing industry, I think he was an agent. I think he was an agent, but he worked kind of in the chad publishing industry. Because obviously in my creative writing, MA, there's a lot of focus on getting traditionally published. And I'm sure. a little bit... I get that, but I'm also a little bit rolly-eyed about it because... You know, if you want to make real money, you're probably not going to do it in the traditional publishing industry. Anyway, this um, this guy wrote a question, um, and I can't I can't remember it word for word, but he had been this this writer who was on the MA course had been talking to a writer friend of his, and the writer friend of his had said, "Well, if you're a straight white male, you're never going to get you're never going to get published, and you might as well not even try." And um, you know his question to the expert was, you know, is this true? What do you think of this? And the, and the, ex, the expert came back and said, what's happening 
is that actually the playing field is being levelled, so it's becoming as difficult for straight white men to publish their books as it has ever been for literally everybody else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, equality can feel like oppression if you have always been used to that level of privilege. It's like, you know, I just need to be this person and my voice will automatically be heard. And that is, it's, it is changing in the trad publishing world, but it's changing slower than we would like it to. And so, you know, if that is your measure of what makes a book worthy, you know, if, if, if being published by the traditional publishing industry is your measure of what makes a book worthy, then I would, I would suggest that you have a sit and, and consider why you might think that a book deal is the thing that makes your book worthy yeah. because of because of the world that it comes from and because of the level of privilege that has been afforded to people who get their books published. And yes, you know, you can look at all of the amazing writers of colour and a few LGBTQ writers now that are getting their books mainstream published, but there's still a fraction, a fraction of the number that are being published from, you know, the 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 other voices that have always been heard. So, so yeah, I just think it's really important to consider, you know, if you hold this opinion, why you hold it, have a little bit of a think about it and consider if maybe maybe you're coming from a place of, you know, being told that, oh, well, this is, you know, think about who's holding the power here is what I'm saying and, you know, what we can do to change it. And that's the wonderful, amazing thing about independent publishing. And Amazon as well, you know, say what you like about Amazon. It has opened up an amazing world for writers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's Jeff Bezos is a shit biscuit, but, you know, <laughs> Amazon itself has opened this world to writers and has made traditional gatekeepers increasingly irrelevant. And that's a good thing. Yeah. That is a good thing. Um, so, yeah. As long as he doesn't become the new gatekeeper. <laughs> yeah. I did, do you know what? I'm not sure he could now because KDP has just become its own thing. Mm. It's like, yeah. And I mean, yes, adverts, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, there, there is still, of course, there's still a level of kind of elitism and privilege. It's like, can you afford to pay for adverts? Yes, then you're going to get your book in front of more people. Yeah. Um, but the point is that in, in the past, you know, self-publishing hasn't, it's not new. Like Virginia Woolf self-published books and stuff. But again, there's a level of privilege that comes with being able to to do that. Oh, yeah, to be able to sit down for a few months and write a book. Is... And then pay somebody to publish it yourself. Yeah, that's that's a... Yeah. And so self -publish... It's a comfortable place to be, isn't it? If you can it do is. that. And so self-publishing has been around for a long time, for hundreds of years, but not in the form that it is at the moment. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know... I've, Democratizing publishing means anyone can publish any odd dross, but it also has opened the doors wide for everybody, especially voices that have been traditionally mar marginalized by the traditional publishing world. So I think that chasing the book deal is vanity now. Mm. If that's the only reason that you're writing the book, if the reason that you're chasing the book deal is because you only think traditionally published books are worthy books, then have a little bit of a sit with that and, and, and consider where that comes from and why you think it. Because, like I said, I would bite Penguin's hand off. I really would. If they came knocking and asked me to write a book, it was like, you know, we want to buy your book. I would be like, oh, my God, this is awesome. But I also know that that's not what makes it worthy. Yeah. Even though part of me would be like, oh, my book is more worthy because I've got all this ingrained <laughs> nonsense to, do you know what all I mean? All this history. Yeah. External validation. That's the thing, yeah. isn't it? It's the external validation from people who aren't the ones that your book is aimed at. And that's the thing. It's like external validation from people who have actually read your book and loved it is one thing because that's like, oh my gosh, I've helped somebody. But external validation from somebody whose aim is to make money, make money off your book. And make no mistake, the publishing, you know, the publishers, the big publishers are aiming to make money off your book and you will see a fraction of that money. That's a totally different kettle of fish. So, yeah, things to think about, I think. Things to think about. Things I think to that's think about. Fair. And I'm not saying... I am absolutely not saying don't go after a professional book deal, don't go after a traditional book deal. I'm not saying that. If that is the right thing for you, sometimes it is the right thing for people. I'm not saying that, you know, you're, I'm certainly not saying that you're less worthy or that your ego is getting in the way if you're doing that. But just really think about the reasons that you're chasing the book deal mm -hmm. and the reasons that you want to do it. It's like some, sometimes it will still open doors. Like in academia, yes, you, you may well do better if you get traditionally published because academia still operates in ivory tower that is the way it operates and so you know you can you can play the game I guess and and you know like I said having a book deal is, is worthy of celebration if that's what you want but don't don't chase that just because you think that's the only way that your book can be worthy fair yeah I think that's fair um 
So yeah. Oh, and also the other thing, a traditional book deal won't necessarily get you in front of more readers, bring you, it won't necessarily bring you all of the PR or the celebrity book clubs and, you know, all of the shiny stuff. It might do, but there are no guarantees of that. So, you know, don't, don't hold out for it. And, you know, if you have written a book or you want to write a book, then you should be proud whether you have a book deal or not, because most people will simply never do it. Um, so what's the takeaway, Joe? Um, if your book helps even one person uh, to live a fuller, kinder, more expressive, creative, profitable, helpful, more surrounded by daffodils life, then that's a worthy book. Yes. Or if it makes somebody laugh until they puke. Also, a worthy book. I love a book that makes me laugh. Until you puke? Well, it's an expression. Okay, okay, right. Um, okay, so that's that, really. That's all I have to say about that. Cool. Um, and I am, I still have a couple of spaces open for my six-month creative book coaching adventure. Nice. Um, so I would love to work with somebody um, who wants to write an amazing book, um, whether independently published or traditionally published. Um, I will help you get the book written, that is my role, yeah. and I will be able to then point you in the direction of other experts who can help you with other bits and pieces. Um, so if you are interested in that, you can go to moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash creative dash book dash coaching or email me vicky at moxiebooks.co.uk um, and book a quick call with me and chat about it. Um, and next week we are talking about the eight deadly sins of basic bitch non-fiction books. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I also have a free writing prompt calendar that you can get from moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash calendar. And if help you, you build a habit. Help you build the writing habit, yeah. Also, um, interesting writing tip, uh, writing prompts. It's not just like, what did you do yesterday? Or what's your favourite food? Um, it's just random shit that comes out of my brain. So enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do people do if they like this podcast? Uh, subscribe. Yeah. Rate us. Rate us five stars. Five stars. Five stars. If you don't want to rate us five stars, that's fine. Other podcasts are available. Um, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from. And please share the podcast. If you know somebody who will enjoy it or find it useful. Or somebody who you think has an interesting story and needs to write a book. Yes. Send yes. Send them a link to moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash podcast. Hurrah. Hurrah. And thank you to Podfly as always, for your endless patience and um, removing annoying sounds, um, <laughs> like me, <laughs> me and my voice. Um, thank you, Harriet, for being awesome. And thank you, Joe, for doing 302 episodes of this podcast with me. No worries. Well, you haven't done all of them. I haven't done all of them. People. Um, but you've done most. Many. I reckon like 250. Probably. Yeah. Right, that's that. Ta-ta. Bye. Thanks for listening. You can find links and show notes on the website at moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash podcast, where you can also sign up for the best daily emails in the multiverse and find loads of free resources to help you write your book. We'll be back the same time next week with more tales from the book writing trenches and the latest on what the tiny sheeps have been up to. 